Accessing grace at the gates of Zion. I, one thing we must understand about God is that He believes in the systems that He establishes. God establishes a system, He believes in it, He does not violate it. He always follows the systems He has established. He respects things He has instituted because God does not do anything in vain. God believes in structures and he has already given man dominion over the earth but he believes in structures for the distribution and dissemination of his grace, his power, his authority. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this privilege you always give us to come and sit at your feet and eat from your hand. We pray that today you'll be gracious unto us, even as your word is coming. We pray, oh God, open the eyes of our understanding. Help us to receive your word as it is indeed the word of God. And let our lives be transformed by your word. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for um, today and you're welcome to church this morning. Today is 12th January 2020. So 12 1 2020. And um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm t- yesterday, last week, last week we, we, Talk about um, the elders at the gates uh, of Zion. Elders at the gates of Zion. And we saw that um, there are gates in both the physical city of God, which is the holy city, Jerusalem, and then there are also gates in the spiritual city, like the city of the living God, which is Zion, which is a picture of the church. And we, we saw what gates stand for. There are, there, and there are elders at the gates. And we saw that these elders at the gates, they are fathers. They are also watchers over souls that God has entrusted to them. They are gatekeepers. They are stewards of the mysteries of God and they are rulers of the household of God. And we saw that they are also pearls. Now, today I'm talking about assessing grace at the gates of Zion. Assessing grace at the gates of Zion. And uh, today's message will actually, for some of you, it will actually be a preparation for the future. Um, it, it, for some of you, it's actually going to be what I always call inoculation. Inoculation against the times to come. And uh, one thing we must understand about God is that he believes in the systems that he establishes. God believes in his systems. And if God establishes a system, he believes in it. He does not violate it. He always follows the systems he has established. He respects things he has instituted because God does not do anything out of out of nothing. I mean, in vain. Whatever God does really, really has a reason why he, he does them. And we have to think like that if you want to be able to understand God and to benefit or to attain God's best. You have to think like that. That whatever God does, there's a reason, there's a purpose. Whatever God does, he has an objective. And also, um, he, he follows certain principles that he has established. That's how uh, God works. I'm going to talk about transacting business with, with, with God or with uh, divine agency. I'm going to talk about that in, in this series, maybe, uh, maybe after this one. Because I realized that 
sometimes we have a very wrong picture of the way God is and the way spirits, spirits or uh, people belong to the realm of the supernatural, the way they think, you know, persons or spirits who belong to the realm of the supernatural. So uh, sometimes we miss out on a lot of things because we don't know how to transact business with, with, with these systems. Now, God believes in structures and he has already given man dominion over the earth, but he believes in structures for the distribution and dissemination of his grace, his power, his authority. God appoints structures for the distribution and the dissemination of his grace, his power, and his authority. Now, even when God created man and God gave man dominion over the earth, um, for instance, in the Garden of Eden, there was a structure that God worked with. The structure was that Adam was the leader and then Eve was to follow Adam. Then together, they were to bring forth and multiply and replenish and have dominion. So the dominion principle of God or the dominion that God said man should have had to come through a structure. Adam was the first and he was the one who was uh, actually formed first. He was actually the foundation of the home in Eden. So everything about Eden centered on Adam's connection to God. Now, when Adam missed it, the whole of Eden missed it. When Eve missed it, it was no big deal. When Eve ate the, the forbidden fruit, nothing really happened. Nothing happened till she gave the food to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And when he ate it, the Bible said, then the eyes of them both were open. So the question is, why didn't Eve, Eve's eyes, why didn't her eyes open when he, she tasted of the fruit? Why did they have to uh, take Adam's eating the fruit for Eve's eyes to open? What, because of the structure. Because of how God had structured things. That this is how I've made it. Now, Adam, that's why it was Adam that God finally addressed. That because you have done this, all of them were punished. But it was because of Adam's disobedience that the whole family was thrown out of the Garden of Eden. So we see that in God's kingdom or in God's economy, um, God has structures that he works through. And that to be able to assess the grace of God, we need to understand these things. And we need to know uh, the structures God instills and then how he works through. For instance, even in the natural family, in the natural family, the structure has always been like this. The father is supposed to represent God to the family. People, the children must be able to know God through the father. That is, that is, that is how God has ordained things. That the children are so, in the natural family, the children are supposed to, uh, they were supposed to have encountered the heavenly father through their natural father. That's the responsibility of fathers. Now, I know that as it stands now, that is that, that thing is not a reality in many homes, in many families. Fathers are not even born again. But if if we go to God's blueprint, that should have been the order. And that is even the blueprint for marriage. That the father represents the heavenly father and directs the family to connect and to see the heavenly father. Now, when the father fails, uh, then the church steps in. But that is not the primary way. The primary way was for people, everybody to get to know God through his father or her father. So, in the Bible, for instance, in Israel, what happened was that God dealt with them according to households. Households. Um, when it comes to Joshua 7 verse 14, when they were going to kill Achan, uh, when Achan stole and that they were going to kill Achan. I'm going to take you from the Old Testament and bring you to the New Testament. And then we'll look at how we can access the grace. It says that, In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to families. And the family which the Lord takes shall come according to households. And the household which the Lord takes shall come man 
by man. Look at the, uh, the, the hierarchy or the stratification of authority. It says that uh, the tribes, so all the tribes, there were 12 tribes. And all the tribes had leaders. Remember, the 12 spies were leaders of the 12 tribes, of which Joshua was the leader of the tribe of Ephraim, and Caleb was the leader of the tribe of Judah, the 12 spies. So after the tribes, then we have families. And these families also had family heads. Then in the families, we had households. And these households, we had men who were standing at the gates of these households. That's how, that's how authority was disseminated. That's how grace was disseminated, you know, in the church, in the wilderness. There were leaders, there were tribes, uh, there were tribes, there were leaders of families and leaders of households, which were men. Every man was supposed to lead the household. That's, that's how God has made it. See, when you rebel against God's ordained structure, you create chaos. That is why if you want to marry as a woman, if you want to marry, the, one of the questions you must ask yourself is that, can this man stand at the gate of my house? If he can't, he's a defective material and he's going to create problems for you. Yes, very important. Now, the Passover, for instance, was done house by house. Exodus 12, verse 3. Exodus 12, verse 3. The Passover. Look at how God instructed when he came to the Passover. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamp, according to the house of his father, a lamp for a household. Every man. So you, you, one lamp was supposed to be taken for one house. And the leader of the house, the, the man, the, the, the father of the house is supposed to take the lamp, kill the lamp, and smear the blood on the doorpost and the lintel. And then they were all protected. That was, that was what happened. Now, come to Exodus 16, verse 13 to 16. Look at how the manna was also supposed to be collected. The manna. So it was that Quails came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning, the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of, the, of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. Now, I want you to underline when the layer of dew, because the manna is always under the dew. And when, okay, on the ground, so when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? That's the meaning of manna. Manna means what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man, let every man gather it according to each one's need. An omer for each person according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. So the manna was not like everybody get up Go and gather manna. No. It was the leaders who were supposed to go and gather the manna and bring it to those in their household or in their tent. You see that God, God follows this, this procedure because he, he, he respects the structures that he has, he has put in place. So every man was to gather the manna for the feeding of his household. Now, when you come to, when Jesus fed the multitude, the 5,000, in Luke chapter 9, verse 14 to 16, um, you will see something. Let's go there. Luke 9, 14 to 16. Um, for those, were, for there were about 5,000 men. See, now, the 5,000 men doesn't mean that the people were 5,000. But, you see, the men stood for households. So, it could be 20,000 people. But then they counted only the men, the leaders. Then he said to the disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. Okay, and they did so and made them all sit down. And then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. Now, the bread was broken, was blessed, broken and given to the apostles. Now, the apostles were in turn give to the leaders of the 50, groups of 50. Because he said, let them sit down in groups of 50. So 50, one, this one group of 50, 
That one is another group of 50. So it was like households. And this group of 50s will have leaders. And these leaders will come and receive the bread from the hand of the apostles and they will begin to share. Now, as they were sharing, then the bread was being multiplied. The bread was not multiplied in Jesus' hand. When he prayed and said, Father, I thank you, the bread was not multiplied. It was when he dispensed it to the apostles and they dispensed to the leaders that the bread multiplied because they were just sharing and the bread was not getting finished. Now, the reason why it's five loaves, talking about grace, you see, the number five stands for grace. So we are talking about dispensing of grace, how God dispenses grace. So grace was dispensed according to the same plan. Let them sit down in groups. Let their leaders, the, lead, the leader of the household, let him go for the manner and f- give it to the members of the household according to the number. That's why he said that uh, to, to each one was given talent according to his several ability. According to his several ability. You know, according to the number or according to the range, the range that that, that thing must reach. That is what the Bible is trying to say. Now, the same, thing, the same thing applies to leaders of nations. Leaders of nations stand at the gates of the nation spiritually. And they usually embody the soul of the nation. These things are uh, things that God has ordained. You know, that's why when the leader of a nation dies, it's a serious thing. It's not just, it's not just something trivial. A serious vacuum is created in the spirit. And it's time for intercessors to actually stand in the gap. Otherwise, certain powers and certain entities will seek to control the nation because the leader of the nation is no more. The, that place is vacant. He is the one who stands at the gate. That's why if you are the leader of a nation, even your utterances, your utterances can open doors for certain things. Your recklessness and your careless decisions can affect the whole nation. In the Bible, David was a leader in Psalm, 2 Samuel 24, verse 10 to 13. David was a leader, and look at what happened. And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Now, when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet God, David seer, saying, Go and tell David, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So God came to David and told him and said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in the land? Or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. Now, it, 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 it's kind of funny, you know, but he had to choose between three bad things, which one he wants God to do to him. And it, this one was not really about David. It was about the whole nation. Because the famine was not coming to David's house. It was coming to the nation. The famine was coming to the whole nation, not, 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 to, not to David's house. You see? Now, so... David represented the nation because he was the chosen leader, you know, and the soul of the nation was vested in him. And so any miscalculation affected the nation. You see, for instance, David um, committed adultery with Bathsheba and his household was affected. His household was affected, you know, and uh, uh, many things happened because he had opened the door for the enemy to enter the household by committing adultery. You see, so leadership is a grave responsibility. That's why I would say, no man takes this honor to himself. You see, he said, no man takes this honor to himself. James 31 says that do not desire to be leaders because they, re- they will receive stricter judgment. Leadership is not about titles. It's not about, it's not about position. No, it's responsibility. It is responsibility. It is a, it's, it's a placement that God must, must do. That's why uh, God will also make sure and then he will invest before 
He places you at the place of leadership. God does a lot of work in you. Because look at 2 Samuel 21 verse 16 to 17. 2 Samuel 21 16 to 17. Look at what happened to David. Then each Benob, who was one of the sons of the giants, the weight of whose bronze spear was three hundred shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zuriah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. Now, uh, David was the one who killed the giant that was about to kill Israel in his youthful days. When he grew and became old, the giant that was to kill David was killed by one of the sons, that he, one of the men that he had raised in, in the army called Abishai. Now, they told David that you will not go out with us again anymore to war because if they kill you, they have killed the lamp of Israel. Now, the lamp is the light of Israel. So, he said, that's why he said, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So, once you strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. Once the shepherd is struck, the sheep will be scattered. That, because, of, because of the kind of um, uh, structure that God has chosen to respect, once the shepherd is struck, the sheep will be scattered. That's, that's what. So, the implication was that uh, if David died or was killed by uncircumcised Philistines, then Israel's lamp had been quenched. Israel's lamp. That's why I always say that if you are a leader, and I'm, when I talk about leader, I'm talking about if you are the leader, the main leader, what you do really matters. What you, that's why I, I said something that I said that if you go to a church and that the main person leading the church is, is not working right. You will not be blessed there. You must, you must leave. That is if you know. If you know that he is not working right, it's going to affect you. And you must leave. That's how God has made it. That's how God has made it. That's why I say, I say that I will not follow you if I see that this ABC, I will not follow you. For, because I have to protect my head. I get TV. So, that's, and, 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 and God, God will not blame you or will not punish you for, for leaving that, that leader. Because you follow people only as you see Christ in them. We don't follow human beings. We follow human beings. As you see Christ, the degree to which you see Christ in a person, the degree to which you follow the person. That's all. If you have this mentality, it will help you. Now, the leaders, leaders, that's how leaders are with their households. They are the lamp of the household. And so, if the lamp goes out, the whole house will be in darkness. And that is spiritual. And that's why we also have to pray for leaders. You have to pray for your leaders because when the leader, the light goes off, the whole house will be in darkness. Now, sometimes you realize in the Bible how human beings can represent a whole group, a whole nation, a whole family, like Jacob. When you talk about Jacob and Israel, they are just one person. Israel is a person, but later he became a company of people. And so Israel was both a person and a nation. So in some parts of scripture, Bible talks about Israel referring to Jacob, the human being. Other parts, the Bible talks about Israel referring to a whole group. When you go to Numbers 23 verse 7, uh, Numbers 23 verse 7 and the verse 10, you see what Balaam said. And he took up his oracle and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. Now, the Jacob here is not uh, the man Jacob, because this one was praying to the people of Israel, but they were identified by the man Jacob because he was the one through whom Israel came. Hello, he was the one through whom Israel came. Now, come to um, 24 verse 17, Numbers 
24, 17. And let's compare that to Genesis 34, 35, verse 9. So Numbers 24, verse 17 says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the Butter the brow of Moab and destroy the sons of Tamil. Now, he said, A star shall come out of Jacob. His a scepter shall arise out of Israel. Now, he was talking about the Messiah, but he wasn't talking about Jacob, who was the son of Isaac. He was talking about Jacob figuratively representing the nation Israel. Are you getting me? Are you getting me? Now, let's contrast that to Genesis 35, verse 9. 35 verse 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padanaram and blessed him. Now, who was this one referring to? Jacob, the son of Isaac. That, this one was Jacob as a man, but the other one was Jacob as a nation. So sometimes, look, that, that's, what, that, that, that's what it means. That's what it means. And so, the leader, the one, the one through whom God birthed the movement or the group he is an embodiment of the group. That's why sometimes people will, people sometimes see me in dreams. And uh, from the dream, I tell them that it's not me, the physical person you saw, but you saw the soul of the ministry or the angel that was responsible for the ministry or the spirit of the ministry. Because me, the physical person, maybe I was, I, I was, I was not even aware that you were seeing me. Yeah. At the PowerPoint, somebody after the program, came to me and, and told me something. And then he said that uh, uh, he joined the ministry uh, in June last year. And uh, he came to play the trumpet for us in August. Then after that, he fell sick. Then he said the sickness was so serious that he was in the hospital for five months. Just on the bed. And nobody was aware. I was not aware. But he said Ehud was. Uh, Ehud, uh, later, he told Ehud. Then he said he was so sick that at a point his mother prayed a prayer and said, Oh God, thank you for our son. If you want to call him home, just call him home. That's how bad it was. Then he said one day he was he, he was following my Facebook um, post and it was youthful and useful Friday. So he said he's forgotten the actual topic, but then he read it. When he read it, Something came to his mind, and then he prayed a prayer. Then he prayed a prayer. Then he said, that very evening, he had a dream. In the dream, he saw that I was coming with a group of people, like people in the ministry. And then I got to his bedside. Then when I got to his bedside, I just stretched my hand towards him like this, and I smiled. Then I held his hand, and I raised him from the bed. And so after that, he said, after the dream, he knew he was healed. And immediately, everything changed. Everything changed. I mean, all the signs were showing everything. Then he came back. And he was at the PowerPoint. And, so, and, and he said that Ernest has been putting pressure on him to come and share the testimony. But he is a type that doesn't want to share and all that. And so he told Bless. And Bless too said, no, you must share this testimony. But he said, no, I won't share. But he finally got the courage to come and share with me. After PowerPoint. Now, there are, there are only two things involved. Because when he, when he saw me in the dream, I was not aware he was seeing me in the dream. Maybe at that time I was even sleeping. I don't know. I don't know what I might be doing that time. But you see, God was showing him something. It was something that God was showing him. And God was showing him the connection. The connection. And, 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 and the, 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 the kind of um, uh, connection that he wants him to have with this mandate. Are you getting me? So that's how it is. That's how it is. One of the things that elders at the gate have is grace. Grace. When I talk about grace, I'm not talking about unmerited favor. I'm not talking about grace as saying God has forgiven your sins. No. I'm talking about grace as a compilation of divine possibilities. You see, everybody as a child of God you have a grace constitution. There's a grace constitution that you have in your spirit as a child of God. In other words, there's a, there are various combinations that you have. 
you are you are a package of many things designed to express Christ in a unique way. So every believer has many things in him that God has brought together to express Christ in a unique way. That's your grace constitution. Grace constitution. Now, the elders at the gates, what they have is the grace configuration. They have the grace configuration that will, that can identify and can develop and can grow and can express your grace constitution. That is what the elders are the gate. That's that's the grace that they have. The, your, the, the portion of your portion of food in due season. Come to Luke 12 for the two. Luke 12 for the two. Luke 12 for the two. And there are many people who I, I remember one, one lady, for instance, also had a dream like that. And she was literally dying. Then as she was dying in the dream, suffering from asthma attack, dying, then um, I mean, she was dying, then she saw that I entered the room, you know, in a doctor's apparel. I entered the room. And then I had, I had prayed for asthma people at the conference. That's Kodesh Mika, no, uh, 2014 December. Then after the prayer, she had that dream. And that was the end of that plague. Because I, she said, she saw that I entered the room. When I came, I just took something, put it on her nose and all that. And then that was all. Now, I will show you why, why that thing happened to her. And why it's not happening to maybe you. I will show you very soon. And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward? Whom his master will make ruler over his household. To give them their portion of food in due season. Now the master of the, of the household who made, made him ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season. Their portion. The household, their portion. Which means that every house has a portion. Every believer has a portion of food. And that portion of food is what I call grace configuration. That can identify, that can develop that can grow, that can release your grace constitution so that you can uniquely express Christ in a way that God wants you to express Christ. That's why the manna was under the dew, the layer of dew. And I explained last, last week that the dew stands for doctrine or teaching. In Deuteronomy 32, Moses said, uh, let, let my teachings be like the dew and the rain. The dew. And that's where the manna is. That's why I said the leaders should go and gather the manna. And then bring the manna to you. So, the elders, the fathers at the gate, they have the grace configuration needed to identify, feed, grow, and release your grace constitution for it to give expression to your grace constitution. That is uniquely yours. That's why, that's the reason why God will lead you to a particular grace. Yes. That's why God leads people to particular places. We shouldn't take it for granted that, oh, I'm just joining the church. No. It's not about joining the church or following a leader. No. You must it is God who leads you. You may not even know that you are being... Listen, some, you know how Moses was called as a man of God to go to become Moses that we know. It was more like by accident. He was just leading his father in law's sheep. Then he saw something spectacular and said, I will turn aside. And that was when he received the call. So, it was God who was ordering Moses' steps. Not that Moses was just going anywhere. No. Saul became a king after he was sent to go and look for his father's lost donkeys. He he didn't know he was going to be a king. He didn't know. But the kingship was within him because God had determined that he would be a king. But the grace to become a king was resident in a man called Samuel. And for Saul to meet Samuel, God had to orchestrate and make sure that his father's donkeys were missing. 
And so Saul will set out going to look for the donkeys. And by mistake, seemingly, he will meet Samuel. Then Samuel will give him a word that will make him a king. That's how God works. So you don't say, oh, I just... No, it was God who led you. There are some, not everybody will, will come to this ministry through a dream. There are some people who actually came here because they had a dream. Some people told me, I had a dream and you said I should come and I came. When we started TMI, for instance, I never told anybody to come to TMI. We were just a small... But some people will come to me and tell me that I had a dream and you were telling me to come and I came. Now, those ones are not a few. They are not many. But there are many people who will not come because of their dream, but they will come because of maybe a thought. Maybe they will come because they think that, oh, let me just go and see what is happening there. And you may think that you are just coming, but it's God who is actually ordering your step because maybe your grace constitution resonates with the grace configuration of, of, of the house. That's why God will lead you to a particular place. Now, let me show you something. I said that the, the fathers carry grace. That's why I say assessing grace at the gates of Zion. Don't, don't deceive yourself. You see, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived into thinking that God doesn't respect institutions and that they are, God doesn't respect leadership and that there are no ranks. There are ranks. They are ranking. That's why I said that even at the gates, there are people who are the gates of nations, continents, and you will go to God and God will direct you back to them. You can go to God and God will direct you back to a man. Because as far as God is concerned, I've placed him at the gate. And all the configuration is in him. Because God knows the people. You see, for instance, when God sends you to a people, before we say God has sent me, it's not like you have received a call. No. It's, it's, it's a whole journey that God takes a person through, preparing the person for the people that he has been sent to. See, there are some people who will hear your voice and they will run to you. And it's all according to God's purpose and God's plan and God's time. There are people who will even hear your voice, not even as in sitting down here. They might hear it on radio, they might hear it through Facebook, they might hear it, and then they will come to you because your, your grace configuration will be speaking to their grace constitution. Yes. And then they will come. That's, that, that, that's, that, that's why people who are spiritual they understand some of these things. Okay, now Philippians 1 7. I'll read it in the New King James and I'll read it in the King James. Philippians 1 7. Just as it is right for you, for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. See, underline, I have you in my heart. In as much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. You are all partakers with me of grace. Now go to the King James Version. Look at the various rendering. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. So Paul was saying that, some people were partakers of his grace. That's why I said that they, at the gates, what is given is grace. Grace. And some people are partakers of the grace that was given him. Because in Ephesians 4 verse 7 to 11, it says, to each one was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And what was he talking about? He was talking about the people God gives as gifts to the body. Now, continue. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Now, when he says he gave gifts to men, he's going to explain. He gave men as gifts. No, he gave just gifts to men. Continue. Now this, he ascended. What does he mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. 
He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, these are the gifts that he said he gave to the church. So, these ones are not gifts. They are people who Jesus himself gave them as gifts to the body. These ones are not gifts. They are not spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are given to the Holy, by the Holy Spirit. And they are given to individuals in the church. You can have uh, gifts of your healing. You can have um, power gifts. You can have prophetic gifts. You can have um, a vocal gifts. No, these are spiritual gifts. But these are offices which are given as gifts to the church. And it says they are given according to the measure of the grace of Christ. The measure of the grace of Christ. You see, one of the mistakes we've made is that we have reduced the fivefold ministries. We think that they are gifts. They are not gifts. It is the people who are gifts. Because they are offices. We identify the fivefold ministry by gifts. So when you see somebody moving in the supernatural, moving in power, confronting, uh, uh, cutting out devils and, you know, teaching them is an apostle. When you see somebody uh, giving word of knowledge and, and all that and all that, he's a prophet. When you see somebody who is doing evangelism, he's an evangelist. When you see somebody who uh, maybe he's gathering people and say he's a pastor. No. That is wrong. You see, it's Jesus himself who sets people in the church as A, B, C. An apostle is not somebody who works miracles and who uh, goes about displaying, uh, releasing the gift of God and all that. No. The apostle must bring, build Christ in you, in the individuals, in the corporate church, and shape their belief system. And bring you into alignment. That is a real detail of an apostle. It's a foundational thing. When you listen to an apostle, you will come into alignment with divine purposes. Your heart will come into alignment with God. It's not about the giftings he displays. Those, those, those ones are tools. The prophet is supposed to impart the capacity to hear God. To see and perceive the eternal plan of God for the corporate church and for individuals. That is the problem. You see, so he does that by releasing grace through teaching. All the fivefold ministry, they impart grace through teaching. Not through laying of hands. Laying of hands, you can just impart gifts or activate and stir up gifts. And that is one deception that we have in the body. So now, people who are gifted, we think they are of a higher rank. It's a deception. That's why we have all these people who are, there are some people who are not even qualified to be leaders in the body of Christ. Going to the Bible, they are not leaders. But because they are gifted, you see many people following them. Why? Because they are gifted. And they will end up leading them astray because they don't have the grace configuration to turn them, turn them into leaders to bring our word is in them. So all they will do is that anytime you want to hear from God, come and see me. If you want to hear from God, come and see me. They will be giving you directions. Do this, come and do this, come and show this, come and do this, come and do that, come and do that. But they cannot impart. Why? Because it takes it takes some it takes grace. To do that. An evangelist is not somebody who is going about winning souls. An evangelist, the primary duty of the evangelist is to the church, not the world. Because these five gifts, he gave them to the church, not the world. So the evangelist is somebody who by reason of his calling, his mandates, and his work with God, can impart to the church a passion for souls. And the evangelist does that primarily through the words he speaks. So far, he can be going about preaching, but his real work is to equip the saints. So when an evangelist is preaching right now, you will feel like winning souls. That is an evangelist. Because it's an, it's an office. And they dispense grace through the words they release. Not through the gifts. 
if if I come here as an apostle, I can activate you in any in your any gift. If right now we start praying and I start activate, I can activate you in prophetic, activate you in evangelistic gift, but it doesn't make you an evangelist, it doesn't make you a prophet. Are you getting me? And that's not my, my role. My primary role will be to lay the foundation to help you to grow, for the Christ to grow in you. So that what is in you will come out. There are many things that we have gotten, we have turned upside down. That's why I said the dew, the dew of Hermon, he said it's like the dew of Hermon that, that is coming down upon the mountains of Zion. That dew is grace. That is the teaching. That when I say teaching, I'm not talking about Hebrew and Greek. See, I'm, t- I'm talking about manna. I'm talking about due season. I'm talking about revelation. It's not about just teaching you uh, doctrines. No. When I say doctrine, I'm talking about the teaching. Revelation. Revelation. So, Many people are deceived because of these things. And you see people um, running to people who can't even instruct them in the Lord. And some of these people, they are leading people. They are leading many, thousands of people. And you see, they are baby Christians. Even some of them are baby Christians. But because of the spectacular nature of the gifts, they attract people. And people follow them, call them Papa and all that. You see, yes, you see, you see it on TV, you see it everywhere, and you see that this person ha- doesn't have the grace configuration to raise believers. All he, the best he can do is to perform for you to see, or perform for you. But the kind of the kind of pattern of sound words that can raise you, they don't have, and and. So those people are not at the gates. But we make a mistake and we think that, oh, once the person has this, that's why the devil is able to deceive us with counterfeits. You know why? Because we are fixated on spectacular things and we are mesmerized by giftings. And so it's like easily deceive us. Yeah. We even rank people by the gift they carry. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. Our, your eyes must open to see. You see, you rank people by the revelation that God has given you about them. Because if Jesus Christ said John the Baptist was the greatest among women, how did he rank them? How did Jesus rank the people that God himself sent and said, John is the greatest? Number one, it means there's ranking. Somebody can be greater than somebody. He said, of all those women have given birth to, John is the greatest. And yet, John never performed any miracle. According to John 10, 42. He said, John never performed any miracle. And yet, Jesus Christ said, he is the greatest. So, you see, it's not about the giftings. That, that's one thing that uh, I believe that um, in this ministry, where by the grace of God, uh, we have come to understand. Because over the period, the teaching that I've been teaching, I've, I've, I've pointed out to you and I've shown you how these things are. And uh, I thank God I also move in the gifts of the Spirit so that you know that I'm not saying that because I don't move in it. Because I move in it. But that is not, that is not the, the basis for the ranking. Now, the grace that God gives to the elders, he gives it to them for the household. Ephesians 3 verse 1 to 2. Ephesians 3 verse 1 to 2. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for Christ is for you, Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, so, Paul was given the grace, but it was for the people. So, the grace of the elders, the grace is given to the elders 
for the people. That's what it is. And when we talk about grace configuration, there are many things that go into grace configuration. Many things. There are the, 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 see how God prepares a person for a people is a process. It is God who does that. There are many things. You can talk about mandates, talk about covenant, talk about personal work, talk about suffering, talk about mistakes. There are many things that will come together to prepare a person for a generation. When I say generation, generation is not talking about maybe people in the world. No. Generation is talking about people who have been prepared to receive your grace configuration. In Luke 1 17, the angel told um, uh, uh, Zechariah about John the Baptist. He said that he will also go before him the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience of the judge to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So the people were already prepared. But John was coming to make them ready because he had a grace configuration that will resonate with their grace constitution. So people can be sent to people. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 to he said, If I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 9 to. If I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Thank you. You are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Yes. Yes. So Paul was saying that if I am not an apostle to others, doubtless I am to you. Why? He said, because I was sent to you. So he was sent to, he was sent to the Gentiles and it was grace. The, the grace that was upon Paul was for the Gentiles. Now, it has got nothing to do with Paul's own education or Paul's own inclination. Now, if God was using gifts and talents, Paul should have been sent to the Jews, not the Gentiles. Because if you want somebody who really understood the law between Paul and Peter, you would choose Paul. Is that not it? Paul understood the law very well. And yet God said, I was, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. So it was not because of his knowledge how he had been taught. It was grace that he was able to minister to the Gentiles. Now, Peter was a fisherman. Peter would have been a, a mess to the, um, the Gentiles. But naturally speaking, Naturally speaking, Paul would have been sent to the, to the Jews and Peter to the Gentiles. But in God's wisdom, God said, no, I'll send Paul rather to the Gentiles. And so Paul knew that it was not because of what, what, not what he had learned. So he said, when I came to you, I determined not to know anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. He was relying on the grace. It was grace that was being dispensed. To the Gentiles, it wasn't it wasn't Paul's knowledge that he had acquired from sitting under Gamelia, no, or from going to the the schools, the learning the Torah. It was grace. So grace constitution, grace grace configuration, is a, num- a number of things that come together. That's why God prepares people, and when God is preparing somebody. You will not be there. God will start way back and prepare the person. Now, there are some people, for instance, right now, the training they are receiving, they think they are going to be pastors or they are going to be pulpit preachers because now God is teaching them things like uh, how to control the flesh and uh, how to um, discipline yourself as a Christian, how to uh, engage the, the things of the spirits. And then how you can prophesy, how you can see visions, and then how you can understand the, 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 the voice of the Lord. So they think that, oh, I'm going to end up in the pulpit. No, some of them are maybe politicians. Some of them may be financial gurus, business gurus that God will raise in this end time to sponsor the, 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 the church. 
Others may be political leaders or leaders in fields that God will raise for them to shape, shape the trend. But you see, look at the training God is giving them. The, because as far as God is concerned, that's the training that will make them, that will, that will cause them to last and make lasting impact. Such people may, may, may think that, oh, as for me, there's nothing business in me. I didn't do business administration. I don't know management. No. Now God is teaching you how to hear the voice of God. Yes. A time will come where when God sets you in your place, you will see that you are a businessman, but you are, you are a spiritual giant who is a businessman. So God will direct you. you now you see that you, have, you develop the art of hearing. And that is, that is the most important thing in any field of life. If you can hear God. If we really want to teach people how to do business as Christians, we must teach them how to hear from God. Because if you hear from God, you will know the right thing to do. If, it, if, it, if, it, if, it, if it's investment, you will know whether you invest here or there. Hello. So the grace was given to, to the elders for you. Now, in First Timothy 3.10, Tim, uh, Paul told Timothy certain things. And that one kind of summarizes uh, how people are configured, you know, grace configuration. In in Second uh, Timothy three ten. This is Paul to Timothy, but you have carefully followed my what doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance. You have carefully followed my doctrine. Now this this is the checklist. If you want a mentor to follow. This, 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 this is the thing that you, you must look out for. You see, for instance, you want a, a mentor. Okay, Moses mentored Joshua, two of us. Now, when Moses was about to die, why didn't he give his rod to Joshua? That would have been perfect mentorship. That after praying for him, then give him your rod. Because this rod is the rod that I used to part the Red Sea. And I used to do wonders. So, take this rod, my son Joshua. Anytime you face difficulties, lift up the rod. Moses never gave the rod to Joshua. You know what he did? He laid out and imparted the spirit of wisdom. In Deuteronomy 34 verse 9, Bible says that, Joshua was full of wisdom because Moses, the man of God, laid hands on him. And so he imparted the spirit of wisdom because the spirit of wisdom is profitable to direct. So these things that Paul was talking about Timothy, Timothy followed his doctrine, his manner of life, his purpose. His, his, His doctrine is the revelation that God has given him. Which resonates with uh, Timothy's grace constitution. His manner of life is the example that he portrays for Timothy. That's why people, you just see anybody and say, oh, you see somebody ministering and you see, like, when the person is, maybe you go to a place, somebody is ministering, and I know that if you are in this ministry, you will not be too much um, carried away by gifts because we have a lot of gifts in the ministry. But you can go to a place, you see somebody ministering, this, 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 oh, wow. Charlie, this, this, I mean, I, I, I just, after the meeting, you just go, please, I want to submit to you. I want to be my father. Papa, Papa, please pray for me. <laughs> you don't know his manner of life. You don't know his purpose. You don't even know his doctrine. All you've seen is his gifting. That's why you go and he will lay hands on you and activate a gift and impart last also. Impart certain negative things also into your life. Because you are just following, you have not carefully followed the doctrine. 
the manner of life, the purpose. That, that's how, this is how God constitutes. The form of doctrine is a teaching, revelation, that God will give you when God raises you as a leader, there, there, there is ma- a mandate, there is a covenant, there is a personal work with God, where God feeds you. He feeds certain things into you. He builds you for a particular people. I was telling somebody yesterday, I said that, there are many people who, who think it's just a matter of get, getting up and uh, gathering youth around them. Listen, let me tell you something. There are many people I've seen who were young guys who started youth ministries. Before one, two, three, they were messing up the ladies in the ministry. They were leading, leading the ministry. Leading, not the, 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 the founders of youth ministry. You see, it's not like you just get up and say, oh, I want to do youth ministry. You get up and say, I want, uh, uh, God has called you to father women, father ladies. Do you, you think it's, you think it's just, it's just, it, it, it's just about, you know, it, no. Before, before God will set you there at that place, he would have taken you through a process and built you. You, you can't even close your zip. <laughs> you can't close your zip and you say you want to do youth ministry. You are, you are, you, are, you want, Somebody came to me some time ago. Then later on, I met the person. Then he said that. Uh, I said, oh, so where is your uh, youth? Where, where are they? They said, man of God, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. This A, B, C happened. I said, look, in the first place, when you came to me, I realized that you were not qualified to start the youth ministry. But you wouldn't listen to me. Because you were bubbling with, with gifts. And you were seeing many things. And the young people too, they are attracted when they see, they see their own age mates uh, displaying the gifts. They will just be rushing to them. Can you pray for me? Can you lay hands on me? Hey, the day you ministered, and then, 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 and this, and that, and that. And, and they'll, they'll be going to them for them to lay hands on them. Some, some, some of them, they, they are deceived by the gift that they are having. So sometimes, you know, I call some people, I tell you that, look, this thing that you are doing, you must submit it. Be careful. You must submit it to leadership. Because you are gathering people and you are leading them and you are a young man gathering people, just leading them. And when they come, you just minister to them. I see A, B, C, C. I see A, B, C, C. I see A, B, C, C. And by the time they came to themselves, <laughs> A word to the wise is enough. <laughs> so the, the purpose is the mandate. Then faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, all these things, they, they add to the grace configuration. All these things. They add to the grace configuration. Because you can't give what you don't have. You can only give what you have. So the grace, all these things, sometimes even including the things the person went through, all those things, they are for the people that you have been sent to. The encounters, the persecutions, the deviations, the mistakes, things you learn the hard way, all those things, God will use them to prepare you. And will, will, it will constitute a grace configuration that will bless a particular group of people. So you see that a time will come, you see that some of you, for instance, God will, a time will come, God will send you to, to specific people. You see, now, what you may be going through is God configuring you. Configuring you. Uh, if you really stay on track, God will build you up. A time will come, you would have been built for a specific uh, group of people. I was talking to one lady uh, in 2013, and I said that, now your life looks scattered 
and tattered. But let me tell you something. Even though these A, B, C, A, B, C, D are not pleasant, they are mistakes and all that, God is constituting a particular grace. A time will come where you will touch certain people, certain specific people you are sent to. You will touch them. And I say that, do you know that not everybody can touch Rahab's Rahab's not everybody can touch Rahab's. And, and, and Mary Magdalene's. But somebody may have that grace configuration to touch them. And it may be that either God will break your heart and, and repair your heart and give you that unique grace to reach out to them. Sometimes, if you are stubborn, you may make some mistakes and pay dearly for those mistakes. But God will never waste those mistakes. Even though, if you are not stubborn, you, you will just, but sometimes in your own stubbornness, you can make mistakes and then God will still take those mistakes and bring them together and configure you to be able to minister to some people that nobody else can minister to them. So God never wastes anything. That's why for you to get to a point where God sets you, it takes time. It takes many things. It takes many things. It takes many things. It's not just about gifts. No. See, the gifts are supposed to help you, develop you. But sometimes the gifts can destroy you before, before God sets you. Because there are some people, a little exposure and they are, they are going to be killed. A little as because it, what 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 shot David into prominence is not what sustained him. You know what shot him into prominence was a gift. Was by when he killed Goliath. That was when he he became a national a household name. He killed Goliath. But that's not what sustained David. That's not what what sustained him to he he made it to the final point of his journey. A king over a united Israel. There was all, all, I mean, likelihood that David would have missed that throne if something else was sustaining him. He was a man after God's own heart. And even when he went, he went to the palace, he would often run back to be with the sheep, the few sheep. The palace was never able to lift him. That's why he was qualified to sit on the throne. There are many people, the small exposure they get, now the, the world itself cannot contain them. That's how, that's how they, they crash. Why? Do you know why? Because the women are singing. So I scale is thousand. David, tens of thousands. And the women too, they sing. <laughs> You know, like I was telling somebody yesterday, I said that, look, women naturally gravitate towards anointing. It's natural. They gravitate, not that they, um, they are, no, they, they gravitate towards the anointing. So, usually, usually, the, it's the woman that will even encourage you in your gifting. Yes. Yes. I remember, uh, one, one day I was I was called to preach at uh, the, at the national women's uh, convention. You know, at that time at GCC. When I finished preaching, many of the women came, and I saw one person who is very close to the head said that, "No, no, no, I must talk to pastor. He must give you a pulpit." That was the last time. You see, I, w- after that, I intentionally dodged. I dodged. I intentionally, in fact, the following year they came again, I dodged. Yeah. 2015 to I dodged. I dodged. You see, it's, it's not that I couldn't have preached. I could have preached. I could have preached. The same way I preached at the convention and they were blessed, I could have preached at the main church and be blessed. But I, I just felt that it wasn't 
I, I shouldn't take that opportunity. I don't. Because if the pastor himself says, come, preach, I will preach. Not when somebody is going to say that, hey, hey, you heard him preach. Hey, did, 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 did. No, 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 no. That's not how we, we, we do things. I could have free, but I just said, no, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to. Because there's some of the women, they can go into your head. Once I preach at a group, women's group, in, uh, on, on, on a Monday evening, then the leader told my parents that, said that, I that I, was, I was about to travel. You know, I was preparing to travel to do my, my master's. But she said that they wish I will, I will preach these things on tapes and leave them with, with them. I mean, that was, that was flattering. I mean, it was like, this was, that was 2002, 2003. I just went to preach on Carest Thou Know That We Perish. That's a mis- that was the title. Carest Thou Know That We Perish. That was what I preached on. After the preaching, everything was, hey, I mean, we just we want you to put it on tape. Just leave it with us. And I, I, I honestly, I thought that she was just trying to flatter me. Because I didn't see any, anything about what I said. But maybe, maybe too, she was maybe blessed. You see, but the thing is that we must, we must know the platform that goes with the grace that you have. And don't rush to be seen. A premature exposure brings premature death. Some people can urge you on. Like I said, in 2003, somebody told me that I should start a church. And it's not somebody, I would say, this is somebody Irish. I mean, a mentor. A mentor told me that I should start a church and that he was prepared to give me every support. Every support. He said, he told his wife, when he saw the vision, he saw that I was leading many people. Then he told his wife, he said, that if this guy starts something, I will give him all the support. Then he told me that if you start something, I will support you. And he said, have you seen, you mentioned this man of God, that man of God, that man of God. A time will come, all of them will be of the scene. And we need people to replace them. And God has shown me that you're one of them. If you start something. But you see, it was just not in me. I mean, I, there was no way I, I could have started a church at that time. No way. And somebody would have, would have taken it and just look at the man's preparedness to sponsor or to, to help and would have gone to rent a place and would have started a church and would have missed out on all the years. Look at 2003 to 2016. How many years? 13 years of training. 13. I would have missed out on 13 years of preparation and training. Different, different encounters, different people I met, different impartations, different revelations. I would have missed out on all of them because of just one step that I was in a rush. So, grace will be, look at Paul. Come to 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 28 to 29. Paul was talking about his apostleship. Anytime Paul's apostleship was challenged, he made reference to the things he had suffered. How he had suffered. You see, what he had gone through. That was, that was what constituted the grace. In, the, in God's economy, your pain is somebody's gain. Your pain will be somebody's gain. Yes. Including the normal, normal things you go through. So anytime they challenge him, you go up a bit, you will see. You, you was talking about the things he had been through. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was told. Three times I was shipwrecked. At night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often. In perils of waters. In perils of Robbers, in pearls of my own countrymen, in pearls of the Gentiles, 
in the city, in the wilderness, in perils, in the sea, in perils, among false brethren, <laughs> in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I'm not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not bear with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Jesus Christ knows that I'm not lying. Because the things he was saying, they will say he's lying. Because he was referring to the, the things he goes through, he says, on a daily basis for the churches, the burden. Very few people know what it means to lead a group. Very few people know. People don't understand. People think that it's just, it just about... You see, when I say things like um, the leader, the, 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 the soul of the ministry is vested in them. People don't understand. So I don't know, know why you're saying that. So it doesn't mean that uh, I, you are the only person who did everything. That is an evil mind. Because the, the, the meaning of what I'm saying is that everybody can say that we are not doing this. God will not be worried. If I say I'm not doing this uh, anymore, there will be concern. There will be issues. There will be judgment. That's why you can say you are leaving me. You are not going to be in the minute. You are leaving me. Nothing will happen to me. At least no judgment will come on me. If I say I'm leaving, I'm not doing it anymore, you will see what will happen. Yes. You see what will happen to you because like God said that the mandate is vested in you. So if you say you are, you are, you are not doing anymore, it means that all the years I've taken to prepare you, now you want me to, you want it to go waste. Because I've taken time to prepare you 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 will make mistakes and I'll correct you. This, these are all investment. I will reveal to you. I will teach you. I will do this. I will groom you. I will rebuke you. I will do this. These are all investments I've done. I've made into your life for so many years. Now this is what I want you to do. And I say you won't do it. It means that I have to go and look for somebody and then raise the person from the scratch. Let the person uh, do this, do that, take you through the processes. So it's not easy to just say that I'm I'm leading a group. No, it has to be a calling. You have to ha- you have to have a mandate. Many people who were called by God, they were not ready. They were not ambitious. Those who were really called by God, they were not expecting the call. Look, check the Bible. Moses was not expecting any call. Gideon, Jeremiah, even Jeremiah said, ah, I'm a boy, I can't do it. All the people God called, they were not expecting to be called. Amos said, me, I'm just a farmer gathering sycamore fruit. Me, I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not anointed, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a prophet. All the people. That's why God will come to you and they will say, no, I can't do it. Moses what is expected to be called? So it's not something you take upon yourself. There are many times I've received impartation in dreams. And in the dream, I was not part of the congregation. I was standing outside. Many times. Many times. Standing outside. The man of God came from the congregation. Came outside. Laid hands on me. In a dream. And God was teaching me something. So you will see that it's not it's not something that you were expecting to do, but it is something that He called you to do. And He breaks you and forms you and vests an interest in your heart and your soul. That's what Paul said. The deep concern that comes upon me daily for the churches. Who is weak and I'm not weak? One day somebody was talking to me about somebody. 
as the person was talking about that person, tears were coming from my, my eyes. And the person was even laughing whilst talking about that thing. But tears were coming from my eyes. And I was, I was like, you do know. You think, you, you, you don't know. Some people, you see, they don't, they, they, don't, they don't even know how it affects you when something happens in the ministry. They don't know. Paul said, the deep concern. I really understand that. Really understand that. Even in, in, in 2 Corinthians 12, 21, look at what he said. Look what he said. He said, Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned, thank you, who have sinned before and have not repented of their uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. Paul said that when he comes, God will humble him, and then he will begin to mourn for all these things. There are some people when they hear that somebody has left the ministry, maybe because of some wrong reasons, their hearts will not even break. They will not even, they will not even be moved. Are you getting me? They will not be moved. You know, it's like, oh, it's really? He's left. But you see, what, the, the more you grow and the more you come closer, you begin to have these burdens. You see people who are even drifting that you will do everything possible to bring them. Praying for them, you know, doing everything possible. Sometimes, even it, it, it will appear as if the people are coming to give you something. That's why you are, you are, you are, you are, you know, always praying for them. You know, they don't come to give you anything. It's a connection. There are few people who understand what mothers feel when something happens to their children. What fathers feel when something happens to their children. If you are not a mother or a father, you will never understand. You will never understand what fathers and mothers feel when something happens to their children. When they catch thieves and they are beating them, you see, you see women, they are holding their bowels like this. Do you know why? Because they, they know what the pains go through to give birth. They know that giving birth is not like, it's not like, excuse me, say, go and sit on the toilet. No, no. It, the, it, it, it will cost you... <laughs> <laughs> you go and say that then prefer that it comes. No. <laughs> it's not like that. It will it will cost you water and blood. It will give you pain. That's why no woman will ever forget the time she gave birth. And even sometimes how the weather was. Yes, they can tell you that, oh, I gave birth to her or him at 12, at 2. You, the man, you may not even, you may know, but you may not even connect. If they ask you, you have to scratch your head before you, because you are the one who was going through. So, Paul said, God will humble me when I come among you. When I hear, he will humble you. That's why he said, do not despise those who lead you. He said, esteem them very highly for their work's sake. There are some people, if as a leader, I don't forgive them, they are uncovered. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you. Now, how do we assess the grace? Now, we are looking at how we assess the grace at the gate, practically. The first thing you must know is that grace must be perceived to be received. Grace must be perceived to be received. Perception of grace leads to reception of grace. If you don't perceive the grace, you won't receive it. Galatians 2.9, look at how Peter and James and John received Paul. Galatians 2.9 And when James, Cephas and John who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. That we should go to the Gentiles and to the circumcised. So they had to perceive. Perceive means you recognize, you see, your eyes are open to see the grace, then you will benefit from it. 
there are, there are many people who will not benefit from certain grace because their eyes have not been open to see the grace. You know why sometimes God will show you certain things and maybe you show you that you see the, somebody, you will see the person in a different light in the spirit. Because you have a certain perception to be able to get certain things. Some people have told me, they saw me as a macho man, saw me as a giant, as a military man, as a what, what, and I'm not like that. I'm not that. But God was giving them a picture. But if you can perceive the grace on his life, you can benefit from the grace that I've given to him for you. Yes, simple. Second Kings 4, 8 to 10. See, this message I'm preaching, I'm teaching you what you must know, what you must do. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shinom where there, were, there was a notable woman and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, so it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there and eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please, let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. So the woman said, I know that this is a holy man of God. That's perception. She perceived the grace on Elijah. That he is a Elisha. He is a holy man of God. You see, in, 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 in the Bible, we talk about holy men of God, not powerful men of God. Are you getting me? In the Bible, we talk about holy men. When we say holy man of God, it means that somebody who has been separated for a particular purpose. She so said that holy men wrote as the Holy Spirit came upon them, as they were moved by the Spirit. Holy men, they were separated. The Holy Spirit overshadowed them. He said, he said, the power of the Most High will come upon you and the Holy Ghost will overshadow you and so that holy thing you will give birth to will be called the Son of God. So, holy man of God, it means that the Holy Spirit has overshadowed him. And she didn't just see Elisha, she saw the grace on Elisha. And that's why she was prepared to uh, 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 make a small upper room, put a bed. Look at the things he put in the, in the, in the room. The same things in the holy place. A table, a lampstand. You see? He said, let, let, let's, let's create an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit will be, that will be conducive for him. So the items in the holy place, the same items, she put. The only thing that is missing is the incense. But that one will come with Elisha himself. When he comes and he prays, he, the altar of incense is there. So the table of showbread, the golden lampstand, they are all there. And a chair. The room she made for the anointing was the same room that she placed her dead son. When her son died, she placed her son in Elisha's room. Because that was the room she had made in her mind, in her heart. She had made a room for the grace that was upon the man of God. If you don't see, you will not benefit. Reception is at the point of perception. Come to John 14, 17. Reception is at the point of perception. If you haven't come to the point of perception, you will not receive. John 14, 17 said, The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, listen, cannot receive. Why? Because it neither sees him nor knows him. He said, you can't receive the spirit of truth if you don't see or know. The spirit of truth, whom talking the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. So, reception is always at the point of perception. When you perceive the grace, then you can receive it. Elisha could have passed by the woman's house every day with the, with the possibility of the woman receiving something, the grace. And the woman would never have benefited. Never. 
because she did not see the grace. She only saw a man. See, she only saw Jacob. She didn't see Israel. You only see Jacob. You know many things about Jacob. You have to see past Jacob to see Israel. To receive the blessing. The woman of Samaria, John 14, John 4, 19. She said, I perceive that you are a prophet. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive, perceive perception. I perceive. That's why God wants us to receive the people he sends to us with his word. Otherwise, the word will return to him. The word will not return void if it is received. If it is received, it will not return void. So, we must, you must monitor the spiritual progress of your elder at the gate. Monitor his spiritual progress. If you are connected, when he is promoted, you will see. When his level changes, you will see. If you are true, because the connection is a heart-to-heart connection. It's not a connection by, it's a heart-to-heart connection. That's why Elijah to Elijah, I said, what you have asked for, it has nothing to do with me. You must just see. That's all. If only you see when I'm taken, you will have it. If not, you will not. Despite all the years he has spent with Elijah, serving Elijah, pouring water on his hand, following him, and all that. Look at the condition he was giving him. Last minute, he wanted Elijah to just lay hands on him and impart. He said, no, no, no. The thing is, you must see. That's, that's, that's how God has instituted it. What you see is what you get. He told Abraham, come out of your tent because I want to show you something. Then he said, can you count the stars? He said, no. He said, so shall your descendant be. It's what you see that you get. Once he was in the tent, there was no way he would be able to see the stars. So God said, come out of your tent. Your vision is too limited. Come out. And let me point you out. Let me point something to you. Let me help you to see something. Look at the stars. And your descendants will be there. He said, look to the north, the south, the east, and the west. He said, all as far as your eyes can see, I've given all to you and your descendants. As far as your eyes can see. That's why I said that if you receive a prophet, the name of a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. There are people who are around certain graces that they will never benefit. Why? Perception. Perception. Do you know why Lisbeth, when he saw Mary, she said, where did I sleep last night that the mother of my Lord is visiting me? Lisbeth, Mary was her young cousin. So she could either have seen a young cousin Oh, young cousin, you are, you are here. But see, her eyes were open and she saw a grace. She said, how is it that the mother of my law is coming to me? Immediately, prophecy. He said, when I saw you, the baby in my womb, the baby was leaping. The baby was leaping, kicking for joy. You see, John the Baptist was, was connecting with Jesus whilst he was in the womb. That's why abortion is a wicked thing. Whilst he was in the womb, he was kicking. Now, so, you must relate, see the spiritual progress because Abraham was promoted to be Abraham, but Lot didn't benefit because he left him when he was Abraham. Never experienced the blessing that comes with Abraham. And the word Lot means veiled. His eyes are blind. He's veiled. He cannot see beyond the natural. He only sees the natural. That's why they say that sometimes 
the, 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 the grace that should bless you will, will, will jump over you and go and bless somebody from outside. Why? Because it's, it's around you and you don't know. But a pest, people always, people, and it's true. When you go outside where they don't know you, they only know that a man of God has come. I'm a man of God with, with grace or possi- divine possibilities has come. But people who know you will say, oh, this person has come. We know all about him. In fact, when he starts preaching, I can continue. God, we've been, li- we've been, we've been listening. We know, we know, you know, when he says impartation, the next is what? Incubation. And, and next is manifestation. We know all that. So some of you, when the, when the teaching, teaching is coming, it's like, oh, this one, he, you said it in his, that other message. And so that's, that's all. I, I, I know. I know already. Yes. <laughs> now, so we have to pass through the gate quickly. Micah 2, verse 12, 12 to 13. Micah. Micah 2, 12 to 13. I will surely, no, okay. Um, okay, yeah. Go to 13. Yeah, I want to show you something. The one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gates, and go out by it. The king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. Now, I just wanted to show you something. Number one, the one who breaks open, he will come up before them. Once he goes up before them, they will break out. And they will break out by learning to pass through the gate. So he will break, he will break open. He will, he, will, he will come up before them and they will break out. I just wanted to use the, the terms in the scripture. Let's see something. So when you say passing through the gate, it means in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1, he said that the, the people of Israel, they passed through the Red Sea and they were baptized unto Moses. They were, they were passed, they were baptized unto Moses. They were passed through the Red Sea and they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. As they passed through the Red Sea, they were baptized unto Moses. You know Moses, the meaning of his name, he was drawn out from the sea, from the river. What it means was that, what it means was that they immersed themselves into the word of God that God gave him. They immersed themselves into the word. That's how you pass through the gates. You pass through the gates by imbibing the words that God gives through him. The teachings, doctrine. As a Paul said, you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose. So, as you follow him, as he follows Christ, and you imbibe the things that he teaches, you are passing through the gates of the elder. That is, that is, that is the only way to pass through the gate to assess grace. True impartation does not come by laying of hands. Be, take it from me. When we say impartation, impartation comes through words. Because words are seeds. People are shaped by the words they continually listen to. That's why God endows the elders with grace. And the grace is dispersed through the things they say. So if you really want to benefit from the grace on an elder's life, listen to the teaching. And imbibe it. Soak in it. Marinate. Immerse yourself into it. Get to know inside out. People don't know. That's the point of reception. That's the point of reception. 
It's not through laying of hands. There are, there are some impartations that you can get through laying of hands. They are just seeds. They are just seeds. It, it's a seed. It's a seed. You are either activated or a seed is sown. True impartation comes by association. An association, you see, association, radiation. Association is not just being together. Association is the words. When we say transference of spirits, transference of spirits is words, 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 words. Do not be deceived. Evil communication will corrupt good manners. Evil association will, will give room for evil communication. That is what can corrupt you. Not just the association, the communication. So, the, in the same way, in the positive sense, for you to receive impartation, it is good association and communication. It is words. That's why God also gives the grace and the grace is dispersed through the words. If you want the grace on the man of God, what, what, what it, you can, it is through the words he says. Through the words he says. God can give you a grace and show you that you are connected to this stream and then show you maybe the, the face of somebody. The person will come and lay hands on you, you know, and all that. But then, if God directs you and says that you are connected to this stream, you better soak in the teachings. Soak in the teaching. When I first encountered Ben in a dream, I had never listened to him. I had never. I didn't even like the way he, he preached. Because at that time, my mentor was Miles Moreau. I, 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 I was following Miles Moreau like you will follow. I mean, there was not a single book of his that I didn't have. Not a single teaching. I could go and I could listen to him make notes. Three exercise books. Yes. I thought I really have internet like this. I used to go to hear me, the shelf, the, the, the shelf in station there, up there, Italy Cafe. And I would type mousemoreau.tv. He was teaching about the kingdom. That was before the kingdom message became popular. He first taught it in his church. And I was watching it on TV. I would make notes. I still have the notes. Three exercise books. Topic after topic. My interest was not in miracles, healing, deliverance, prophetic. No, no, no. My interest was in teaching because I was doing Mars Moreau and he was a teacher. And I soaked in his teaching. I mean, to the extent that people wanted, if people wanted his books, they would have to come and see me. So when Ben he came on the scene and I had the dream and he came and laid hands on me, I was confused. Because it's like, ah, I'm not in for this. Because that is not my mindset. This is not the area. The area I want is the teaching. How he will break the word. How when Mark Moreau takes uh, Genesis 1 and he's breaking it and he's teaching it, you see that you flow with him. So when this other dimension came and when he laid hands, then I started going after his videos, his books, his preachings. Because I realized that if I receive an invitation, I need to also receive and soak in the words. You can, you can soak in messages. Then you will come to a point where your eyes are open. I was list, I was watching Bishop Ajahn Asari. I used to watch it. Well, I used to watch and listen. Then one day, suddenly, I said, do people really know that this man is very, very anointed? My eyes were open. I was at the office, ministry office. I was just watching him. I said, hey, so are people aware that there's an anointing on this man? So right there, I knelt down at the office. I said, Lord. And I had been watching several hours, praying, watching, praying, watching. That same evening was when I had a dream. Then he came and he laid hands on my palms and I saw oil in my hand. Then he said, pray for your family. After that, go and pray for people. And I I received a definite impartation of a gift for deaf ears through following him on video. So that's how grace is contacted. 
It's not a matter of just being a So that's how the grace is imparted. Now, Malachi 4 5. We are going to be very fast because of time. We have not fully come to Malachi 4 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the lady of the Lord. Continue. And he will turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now, anytime father son relationship is disrupted, grace, the flow of grace is affected. So you say that unless he turns the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, he will smite the earth with a curse. So I just wanted to see that there's a relationship between that that's how grace is dispersed. Not until the person becomes a figure, father figure, the grace will not flow to you. That's why when the prodigal son, when he came by, you know what he said? Luke 15, 13. He said, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. It was a father he sinned against. But he said, he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Luke 15, 13. So, it was against heaven and in your sight. Why? Because when that relationship is disrupted, the flow of grace is affected. Because grace is released efficiently, efficiently through the father-son relationship. By that, I mean covenantal relationship. Covenantal relationship. Covenantal relationship. I think it, it will be down there, not 13, but down there. Now, you see in the Bible, you see so many relationships and uh, the release of grace. You see Ruth and Naomi. Ruth stands for father, a father figure. Naomi stands for son, son figure. I'm, uh, sorry, Naomi stands for a father figure. Root stands for son figure. You know, that was if father is not just male. Talking about a, a, a figure. So, Ruth and Naomi. Look at Ruth chapter 4, verse 13 to 15. you see Ruth and Naomi. It says that, um, Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. So, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he went to her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, you see, the word, the word Naomi means graced. Graced. And the name Ruth means seen. And Ruth was from Moab. And Moab means what is a father. So Ruth was coming from a place where they despised fathers. I get it. And then she got to Naomi and she saw grace. And then she was seen because she saw. And when they came to her, like, what happened? Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. So Ruth became the perfected sonship. Seven sons. I don't have time to talk about that because... Uh, later on, I'll talk about the seven stages to sonship. If you say that you are a son, the seven, but I, I won't talk about that today. And I picked, I picked it from here. He said, it's more than, that's why uh, Elkanah told Hannah, he said, are you not worth more than me than seven sons? So you see Enoch and Methuselah. You see mentorship. Abraham and Isaac. Jacob and Joseph. Moses and Joshua. 
You see, David and his mighty men. Now, David and his mighty men, they, they are a, a picture, a picture of how grace is released. Grace is retained for sons in covenantal relationships, not sons of concubines. Genesis 25 verse 6. I will finish very soon. But Abraham gave gift to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. Uh, these concubines, Keturah was one of them. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from his son, to the country of the east. Continue. No, go back. Go back. And Abraham gave all he had to Isaac. But he gave gifts to the sons of the concubines. But all he had was given to Isaac. That's why I said that grace is retained for sonship, covenantal relationship, not just connections. In the prodigal son, the elder brother, the father said, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. In Luke 15, 31, he said, all that I have is yours. Jesus Christ said that uh, the son abides always in the house. Luke 8, 35. The son abides always in the house. Now, now there are four S that you must write down. S. Four S. Four S. How to assess grace. Four S. The first one is serve. Serve the grace. Paul said of Timothy, said, for you know as a proven son, he has served with me in the gospel. He served the grace. God can direct you to serve the grace. And you will receive, you, you will access that grace to serve it. Everybody and the way God will direct him or her. But you can access grace through service. Elijah, Elisha poured water on the hands of Elijah. That was service. Sacrifice. Number, uh, second is, is sacrifice. Sacrifice. And sacrifice doesn't go alone. It goes with obedience. So, it is God directing you as to carry out a particular sacrifice for a particular grace. It's not that you just get up and say, I'm sacrificing. No. God directing you to carry out a particular sacrifice. Particular grace. That's how you access the grace. Sacrifice. You see, that's why sometimes people can see that the Lord directed me to go and uh, sow this into this person and then I receive this or that. That's how God directs. Go and give this. You see, the, the gift, the grace of God, they are not for sale. I never sold any penny before I received impartation from Benihi in a dream. Never sold any penny if I received protection from all these people, the whole side, so all these people, I never paid any money. Never sold any penny. But there was a point where the Lord instructed me to go and sow specific amounts in some people's lives. Specific amounts. All through dreams. And I went and I saw. And these were sacrifices that broke me. When I say they broke me, it means after sowing that, I was broke. Yes. And you, if I, dis, if I, if I told you, you will need, you, you will discourage me because of the circumstance at that time. And that was also how the instruction came. And I had to go 
There was another instant. That one was not a big amount. There was just something small. But that one to God said, give all to this man. I took all, went and gave it to that man. That same evening, I saw that man in the dream. Came to lay hands on me. Spoke certain words over me. That's how you contact grace. It's through obedience. If it's through obedience, that leads to sacrifice. Sometimes God can tell you, go and give this amount. And you see, God knows why, because he, he, you, it's the obedience that releases the grace. Not the quantum of sacrifice, the obedience. And when God is specific, you must always be specific. And if you do that, you will see God himself releasing grace on you. Then the third S is so. So. S-O-W. You know, so has come to be accepted to mean sowing money. Yes, yeah, so so. It means that ministering physical, material, or financial resources to the grace on a person. Do you know something? It is a right. Listen. This one, listen. It is a right of your elder or father or shepherd it's right for you to minister material or financial uh, resources after he has ministered spiritual resources to you. It's a right. It's not a privilege. It's a right. But we don't use that right like, that, like Paul. In 1 Corinthians 9.11, look at what Paul said. 1 Corinthians 9.11. So I'm, I'm, I, I, it's, it's a right. It's not like a privilege. No, it's a right. But we don't use that right. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If I sow spiritual things to you, I have a right to reap your material things. It's a right. It's not, it's not a privilege. It's a right. Yes. In fact, one of the Man of God, now ask me to show this healthy amount. Some of you, if I mention that amount, you collapse. I don't think anybody here has ever shown that seed all your life. <laughs> if you like, come, come and see me after church and let me mention the amount to you. One of them, as I was going with the envelope, big, not small, big envelope, I had written Galatians 6 6. Galatians 6, 6. One of them had written Hebrews 7, 6. These are all various revelations that came to me. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. He was talking about giving and receiving. Sowing into the anointing. Because you have benefited, spiritually speaking, from the anointing. I took that seed and I wrote Galatians 6, 6 and I went to that man of God and said, please, I want to sow this seed. He said, why I said I just want to be obedient to God because I've benefited, I've drank from his fountain. I've drank from his fountain and I've benefited spiritually for him. Go to Hebrews 7 6. One day I was praying and it coincided with Father's Day. I didn't know it was, I didn't know I, I it was later that I, I saw the connection. I was praying, then the Lord said that take this money. That you have been expecting for some time that has come. Take this whole amount, the whole amount. Go to this person and then go and give that money to him. He who is not right from then received tithe from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And Lord said that you have some promises, you need blessing. So I carried it, made some few calls. To people who could connect me to go and sow that seed. Very early in the morning, like 5 30, I was there. It was a, the Sunday after Bishop's wedding. I was in a crowd. It was 16th of 16th June, Father's Day, and I went there. So the man of God had just come. He was going into his office to prepare for the morning service. When he got there, I was there by the door. Then he said, What do you want? I said, I've come to see you, sir. So, he went inside. 
I said, please, I've been instructed to show this seed. Then he took the envelope, big envelope, not small envelope. <laughs> then I had written Hebrews 7, 6 on the envelope. So I just gave the seed to him. Then he prayed for me. But you see, I had benefited spiritually for him before I released the seed. What we normally do is that we carry a seed and say, please, I want the grace on your life. It's wrong. It's wrong. What you, what you must do is that the seed you sow should be a seal on a spiritual benefit you have received from the grace. Are you getting me? So you have received a spiritual benefit and you sow a seed as a seal of that. Not that you are going to sow the seed. But if you do that, you are like Simon the Sorcerer. Are you getting me? You are like Simon the Sorcerer. Take this money so that anybody and lay hands, so that anybody I also lay hands will receive, so that you are either you are buying the gift. No. But the money should the seed should be sown when you 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 see the spiritual uh, benefit that came to you. Then it becomes a seal. On that's what Abraham did. When you go to uh, Genesis 14, verse 19, let me read that one. Let me show you something. Look at what Abraham did to Melchizedek when he met him. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Which came first? The blessing or the tithe? Which came first? The blessing came first. In fact, Melchizedek brought bread and wine first. Eh? He brought bread and wine and then he released a blessing. And Abraham released the tithe to seal that blessing. That's why sometimes when somebody is giving prophets, they go and sow seed. That is scriptural. When somebody is ministering, then go and sow seed. It's scriptural. When somebody is preaching, go and sow seed. Sharing testimony, go and sow seed. Why? Because the person is releasing spiritual substance. And because you are being blessed, you are tapping into the atmosphere. That one is scriptural. But not that what we do, carry a seed, oh, man of God, pray, let, let, let your grace come upon my life. If you bring that seed, we will take it and then pray for you. <laughs> and pray for you from our hearts. Okay? Actually, uh, God can also instruct you to go and sow a particular seed. It might not be because you have benefited spiritually. There, there was a time I was also trying to go and sow a seed. I had it in the dream. It was money that I had, God had told me to give all the money that would come into my hand in the month of uh, January uh, 2018. Every money, every money, salary, everything, seed, everything. So I put all together, all together, you know, some, it, it was a big amount, tens of Thousand, not not like small small uh, uh, two uh, two, uh, two thousand five thousand no, no. tens of thousand. Yes, I want you to know. So, yes, <laughs> but you see, it's not amount; it's the heart. When I got there and I gave the seed to the man, the man asked me. He said, "So, what is the prayer? What do you want me to pray for?" I said, "No, please. I just want to be obedient. That's all." I said, I just want to be obedient to God. So I just gave, but because in the, in the dream, he took oil, rubbed my eyes several times, laid hands, and spoke concerning something. When I said that, I said that I just want to be obedient. And so he took the, the envelope. Then he said, let's pray. Do you know something? The prayer he prayed for me in the dream was the same prayer he prayed for me physically. I said, this is God. Because if I had said, oh, man of God, I've seen that, see, you have been, uh, I've seen God have been blessing you. I see the nice car you bought and I really want to tap into that blessing. You would have prayed that for me. It would have worked, you know, but then the real thing God didn't have received was not a car. It was grace. It was grace. So, as I stand here, there are many injections I received. Spiritual injections. Graces, many of them. And they, I received them through obedience. Then the last one is strong support. 
strong support. This is the last one. Strength, uh, strong support. If you support a grace, you will tap into the grace. And you know what you do by supporting. You know what you do by supporting. In the process of supporting, you strengthen yourself and develop yourself whilst you are supporting the grace. Come to First Chronicles. We are going to read two scriptures, then we close. First Chronicles 2.1. First Chronicles 2 1. Then 21 to 22. No, First Chronicles 12. Sorry, 12, 12, 1. 12, 1. Now, these were the men who came to David at Ziglag while he was still a fugitive from Saul, the son of Kish. Now let's listen to something. The people came to David. These people who came to David, some of them, they were. Uh, Bible, Bible, they were 400 men. Oh, the Bible said that they were people who were discouraged, who were in debt, who were distressed, who were disgruntled. But they also came to David when David was not king yet. David was still a fugitive, running away from Saul. And these men came to David as Ziglag. Now, and they were among the mighty men, helpers in the war. So, they were coming to help David. But they ended up also being developed and becoming mighty men. David, they didn't come to David when David was king. How you get TV? Not when David was, was king already. If uh, David was king and then you, you come, I mean, the guy has already become a king. It's, that's not support. But while he was not a king and he was still a figurative from Saul, then these people came. And what? They were also attracted to David. And they came. They were coming also with issues. They were depressed and all that. And they came to him. And David himself was also not fully developed. But look what happened in, uh, in the end. Come to verse um, 18. Okay. Then the spirit came upon Amasai. The, the name Amasai means bedding bearer, chief of the captains. And he said, we are yours, O David. We are on your side. O son of David, peace, peace to you and peace to your helpers. For God, for your God helps you. So David received them and made them captains of the troop. Go to 21. 21. And they helped David against the bands of raiders. For they were all mighty men of valor. And they were captains in the army. Continue. For at that time, they came to David day by day to help him. Until it was a great army. Like the army of God. So you see, these people, they met David while David was at Ziglag. And he was running away from Saul. And he was still a fugitive. Running away from Saul. He was not king yet. And so they were coming to support David. But as they were supporting David, God was also helping them. And eventually, they became great men. When you look at Second Samuel, he was listing their achievements. And one of them could fight, kill a lion in snow, snow time, with the bare hands. One of them could fight till the sword was stuck in his hand. And all the mighty acts they, 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 they did. But they came to David not as mighty men. They came as people who were discouraged and tattered and all that. But then David was also running away from Saul. And so as they were supporting him, they were also developing. If you offer strong support in the process, you strengthen yourself and you develop yourself until you come to a place. In the Bible, Saul, Paul taught about people who labored with him. Philippians 4, 1 to 3. You can write them down. The people who risked their necks for him. Romans 16, 4. He said, Aquila and his wife Priscilla said they risked their necks for me. Galatians 1, verse 3 and 4. He said, those who are with me, people who were with him. And then Philippians 2, verse 20 to 22. He said, Timothy, he said, there's nobody who is like-minded, who will genuinely care for your state. He was talking to the church of Philippi. He said that, I'm sending Timothy because 
I see that there's nobody who is like-minded, who has caught the spirit, who can care for you as I will care for you. So, we have to know how to. So, the, all this one, they are under connecting systems. So, you have to connect to God, connect to the body, connect to the elders at the gates. That's why I'm taking time to talk about all these things. And as I've talked about it, I want you to know that I want you to know that this is this is something that um, is a principle. Any, I, will not, I will not teach you what I don't do. Are you getting me? What I, 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 I'm not a hypocrite. What I teach, I do. Anything I teach, I do. If I, I, I teach what I do, not what I don't do. When I come and make statements and say this, it means I also do, I also do those things. I mean, good things. Because it's an example. And my fear is that if we don't revise our notes, there are certain things that we may not benefit from. That's why I say, for some of you, it's against the future. Because there are people who are coming. It's not only you who are supposed to benefit from this grace. There are many people who are coming to benefit. Many people. A time will come, you will see that you, if you don't come early, you will be outside. Uh, you take it from me. You take it from me. A time will come, you will see that some of you a time will come, you'll be very jealous. Do you know why you'll be jealous? Because you will see people assessing the grace that you has been with you all this while. You have never assessed. Because of familiarity. Do you know something? I don't need your money. I don't need anything. I don't need anything from you. Believe you me, God is my witness. I, I, I'm, I, I'm okay. By the grace of God. I'm okay. I don't need you to come and serve me. I don't need you to come and sacrifice for me. I don't need you to come and sow to me. There, there was a time when I used to, when I would go to schools to preach and they'll give me money, I would just reject, reject it. The one day God rebuked me through a man of God. He called at five. Then he said, what have you been doing? Why is it that when you go to place to preach and they bless you with offering, you don't take it? He said, God says it's pride. And you are neglecting the system that I have put in place. He said, even if you won't, you won't take it, collect it. Pray for the people. Because God wants them to assess grace. That is from your life. So, when you sow a seed into my life, it's not a donation. It's not a funeral donation. It's not like, you are like, oh, 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 listen, listen carefully. <laughs> listen carefully. When you sow a seed into my life, it's not like you are giving me, no, you are being blessed. The same way, when I receive instruction and I sow seeds, I don't go to those men of God and, and, and go with an attitude of, I'm come, I've come to you. Uh, bless you. No, I go there with humility because I need something from them. But the way to assess it is through that. The most important thing, the words. That's why I said somebody was listening to Youthful and Youthful Friday and he had that encounter and he was raised on the, the bed of sickness. Somebody too will be here and the person will not have anything like that. Why? Proximity. So, familiarity breeds contempt. It happens all the time. All the time. So, sometimes what I do is that I review things. Because sometimes there are some people who can be in your life. You may take them for granted. And you may not know the spiritual grace that God has put on them for your benefit. Are you getting me? 
Are you getting? So, make it a point. Because all the things that I've been teaching, writing, releasing, it is for you. Not only you, for many other people who are to, who are to come. You see, for, for in February, I'm going to start this uh, marriage school. Do you know why I'm doing that? I, I, I'm doing that, first of all, for you, but not only you, because we are going to get it recorded. I'm going to take time to talk about everything. I mean, if you, it would take us a whole year, I'm going to be doing every Sunday talking about marriage, talking about a relationship, biblical ways to, f- to find out how to marry, who to marry, and all that. And then the married life, because it's a course in the school of ministry. Course 205 is marriage. And so if we have like 52, example, 52 topics just on marriage, I know that I have dispensed every grace. As far as I'm concerned, there shouldn't be anybody here who, who should have problems in marriage. Are you getting me? If, if I'm able to teach what I want to teach, and I'm able to release everything, all the things I've learned, the things God has spoken, the things I've learned, all the knowledge, revelation, everything about marriage, even including experience, little experience, and I'm able to put all in see, uh, messages, and you have various topics you can listen to, and know and be guided and know how to make the step. Nobody has an excuse to make a mistake in the choice of a partner, make a mistake in marriage. So those who are serious, you will see from their lives that their marriages will take after the grace of God that is on our marriage. You mark it. There are some some people who will be serious. You will see them. Not now. That's why I say this message is not for now. You see them maybe 10 years that you trace it. You see that this person has made it. He got it. There are people who will not bother. But as far as God is concerned, the grace has been released. Somebody got uh, better for best. Somebody in the US. He, he, he got one of our pastors in the US. He asked me to give him all the books I've written. And most of the books I've written are out of print. Some of them have only one, one copy. So I said, okay, this, I'll give it to you. This one, I have just two copies. I have to take my wife's own. I'll give it to you. And then I put all together, give it to somebody to send to him. You know why he called for all the books? He said for some four consecutive times, he has been encountering me in the spirit, in dreams. And he realized that any time he encountered me, I gave him one of my books. And I was telling him that, look, what all that you need for this is this, read it. And so he took all. And he, he from that time, he, he, can't, he can't keep quiet. He said, this, this he can take his blessing him. How many people here have not even read for better for best? And yet have entered relationships. Making all sort of mistakes, avoidable mistakes, things I have taken time to write about, spoken about. Mess. Why? Because you have taken it for granted. It is the, it is it is what has been packaged for you that will help you. Sometimes it will pay me, but what what can I do? If it pays me for some few hours, it will go. It's you. You will be in the in the soup. I I am not in the you even though it will pay me, I'll feel for you, okay? But you you will be suffering. Are you getting me? You'll be suffering. I, I will feel it for some time. I can even weep and pray for you. Oh God, help him, help her. Oh God. But you will do the actual suffering. Because you neglected food, your portion of food in due season. Br- bring your mind home. Eh? Bring your mind home and focus your mind. Don't, don't, don't just be somebody who just comes to church. No. Focus your mind. Start digging. You, 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 you will see the grace in it because it was for you. Start digging. 
Start listening. That is how you, you that's how you will see the grace. People think that when you say grace, you are talking about uh, money and all those things. All those things are there. But then, the key to those things in destiny is the word. And you must know how to assess it. And we shouldn't just be people who just, uh, we just, jump. no, it's not like that. There's a grace that I want you to get. I, I, I don't see any reason why anybody in this ministry will marry, for instance, and divorce. It would be, it would be a failure and a, a, a dent because of the grace that God has given us for marriage. I don't see how anybody in this ministry, you will not be a student of the word. It should be it should be a contradiction. Are you getting my point? I'm just talking from my heart. So just listen to what I'm saying. I'm really, really admonishing you. There are certain things I may say, I will not say them again. Because as I'm saying these things, it appears I'm talking about myself. Is that not it? That's what it appears. I'm talking about myself, how you must listen to my message. Do you buy the message? Do you give money from, from the message? How you must listen to my teachings? Somebody is thinking that. So why is it that you should listen to your teachings? You see, you have an evil mind. <laughs> Let's be on our feet. <laughs> it's not easy talking about these things, but you must talk about them. I must teach you what you must do. Yes. Let's 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 pray and ask God to help us and to open the eyes of our hearts. Not to see only the physical, but to see the spiritual. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Touch our eyes, O God. Open the eyes of our hearts, O God. Let us see from your perspective. Let us perceive. Let us perceive to receive. In the name of Jesus. Oh, le brodo shikere mandos. Ma kande kratale mikos. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's pray for this anointing that was on the sons of Isaac. That God will open our eyes. That we will we'll, we'll, we'll be able to perceive spiritual things. Things that God have, God has ordained for our glory, for our blessing, for our lifting. That we'll be able to see. In the name of Jesus, there are sometimes God will send certain people your way. You may come across certain books, strategically positioned on your path of destiny. Certain messages, certain men of God, strategically positioned on your path of destiny. But without the ability to perceive, you will miss them. And we are praying that God will grant us that ability, that grace to perceive, to connect in the spirit realm, to connect the dots, that the Holy Spirit will be active, active, Active in our hearts, active in our imaginations to connect dots for us in the name of Jesus. Rimeka tani makose, vro tani makose, alaha, kranta tari bokose, ro keke brata le bohose, ro tande brodo sikaraha, inga tala migose, hon kaka li krotos, rika di brada la basute, ra kaka li brodos, vile makata ni mokose lehe, ikanda sika no shenehaka, kole bokose, inka di krata le mokose lehande, ro kata li mokose, yande kata ala kali krata sho remekisko kiana kadim yanti krato shlehang oh balisin tataha help us lord help us lord 
Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, not to miss, not to miss our way. You are able to help us. Let your mercy order our steps in the name of Jesus. Let your mercy order our steps, oh God, to the right places at the right time in the name of Jesus. Anything that will be of benefit to us along our path of destiny, Father, orchestrate our steps to Him. It can be a book that we must read. It can be a ministration we must encounter. It must be a man that we must encounter. It must be a woman that we must encounter it might it might be a message that we need orchestrate our our, our, our steps oh god to meet the right things at the right time at the right places in the name of jesus in the name of jesus we are praying for this nation. We are praying. Uh, you know, many, many things are happening in the nation. Um, <clears throat> we, I want us to pray. Uh, when we went for the PowerPoint, Pastor Collins was giving a prophetic uh, decoding of certain things. The, the coat of arms linking it to the logo of K University and all uh, the prophetic uh, significance and all that. And we prayed into them. But I still want us to continue with that prayer. That prayer... We should not just pray it once. I want us to continue. Even the watchers, they should continue praying into those things. And then every time we meet, we should pray into those things. That anything that the enemy, uh, and through Asian covenants and authority figures, has used to cripple the wings of the eagle, as represented by KNUST, by the Santa Kingdom, by the youth of this of, of 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 this nation we are praying that there will be there will be a clash of powers and that the powers that have suppressed these wings for a long time will be broken and will be broken beyond repair beyond remedy let's pray in the name of jesus I katana makadus vande brata basotele kande kosheta. We break the hand of oppressions in the name of Jesus. We break the hand of oppression in Jesus' name over the youth of this nation in the name of Jesus uh, over our coat of arms in the name of Jesus over KNU West in the name of Jesus and we liberate that eagle to fly and to soar this is the year of the eagle that eagle must be liberated because when that eagle is liberated the destinies of many people will take off in the air in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus we are coming against meetings that have been held in secret places, uh, trying to subdue the, gen- the destiny of Ghana, trying to hijack the destiny of Ghana. We are coming against those meetings. We are making nonsense of those deliberations, those decisions. We are making nonsense of those transactions in the name of Jesus, that they will not stand in Jesus' name. Any group of people who have come together to try to enforce Asian covenants to suppress this nation and to plant this nation into chaos and to call this nation to be derailed from destiny we scatter their meeting and we make nonsense of their transaction and their decisions in the name of Jesus we declare it's null and void that it will not prevail that the hand of God will prevail over them in Jesus name that the strong man the divine strong man will be empowered to break that those agreements to break those decisions and to step into them and make no sense of them in the name of Jesus. We are praying to the 2020 election. We are praying to this year's election in the name of Jesus. That anybody, any group that will at- attempt to cause to cause Ghana to be plunged into 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 a state of chaos and to be the, for the destiny of this nation to be hijacked, like we are coming against the agenda in the name of Jesus, and we are superimposing the agenda of God that 2020 election will be peaceful in the name of Jesus. That 2020 election will be peaceful. That the one the people will choose will indeed sit on the throne. 
in the name of Jesus that we, we come against any attempt, any manipulation in the spirit, any attempt to derail Ghana from its destiny, its part of destiny. In the name of Jesus, what God has invested in the spirit uh, that will prevail because Ghana will not die. Ghana will live in the name of Jesus because revival is coming to Ghana and prosperity must come to Ghana in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise. Father, we thank you. We bless your name for today. We pray that you grant us spiritual sensitivity. Pray that you grant us connectivity. Grant us the dexterity. Grant us the ability to be able to know and to see the spirit of knowing and seeing, perception of the spirit. Let it be our portion. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.